the importance of interdisciplinary teams can't be emphasized enough in terms of bringing technology and medicine together. So one of the things that we do with making surgical robots is the outcomes are, fa are centered on the patient, but the technology is really about augmenting the surgeon and augmenting what the surgeon can do. And so I like to think of we can make people into surgical superheroes. Because this is what surgery looks like when you need to do an open incision to tinker with the body on the inside. And you cut a hole, and you can get your instruments and your eyes inside. With the advent of laparoscopy in the 1980s, long cameras were introduced with uh, the ability to bring light into the body and long surgical instruments that you could use to operate at a distance inside the body through small incisions. But they ended up being somewhat limited in their application because for fairly simple surgeries, they worked very well. But as surgeries got more complicated and you needed to do more reconstruction inside, people reverted to open surgery and continued to do open surgery. That was the technology gap into which the da Vinci surgical robot was introduced. And so this is the business end. This is the, the wrist that you put on the end of the instrument that you can put in through the small incisions. And the intuitive part is that for the exact motion of the surgeon's hand where they're sitting at a console, their surrogate hand, their small metal hand inside the body, is doing exactly that same motion. So if you're repairing a heart valve from the inside like this, you can place the instruments in between the ribs, small incisions without having to cut open the sternum. If you're working inside the abdomen, inside the thorax, or through the mouth into the uh, tongue base and into the larynx, you're not having to make this large incision to be able to get inside. The Da Vinci is not the only surgical robot out there. It's one of quite a few that are out there. Most are in the world of fixturing and cutting or haptic wells. These are uh, uh, orthopedic surgical robots, which are involved in helping to either uh, guide you for a better knee implant or being able to guide the surgeon to put a spine uh, fusion in more easily. There's also a whole host of flexible surgical robots that are starting to come out, from indwelling catheters to treat atrial fibrillation, to uh, GI robots, to that uncomfortable colonoscopy that was talked about, where you're not looping. You can actually make it a little bit more easy, easy to navigate, but also to be able to do something on the inside of the colon. So more and more, there's going to be robots coming into operating rooms. And it starts to look like this. The big idea is that you take the method of access, a big open incision, and you can send somebody home with a few Band-Aids on their belly instead. And this has been growing over the past 10 years in terms of numbers of procedures. And now in the US, 85% of the prostatectomies done in the US are done with the da Vinci robot. And that's primarily driven by outcomes. The complication rates are considerably lower than open surgery, the readmissions are lower, and the mortality is lower. And this has driven this going upside down of the market, where it had been 4% laparoscopy at the peak of laparoscopy, and everything else was open surgery. And now that's completely flipped over, and we're seeing 85% of surgeries are, being, are uh, done with the da Vinci. We also see this happening in the next procedure that's following and has overtaken prostatectomy in hysterectomy, <laughs> again, driven by complication rates being considerably lower and readmissions being much lower. And so in cancer hysterectomy, we went from 88% open in 2005, now down to about 72% minimally invasive, which is a very big change that's happened in this market. And these are women who would have gotten open surgeries otherwise. Colon resection, it's earlier in the data gathering, but we're seeing similarly uh, good results in terms of the large population-based studies. And these numbers that I'm showing you are based are from large database studies that are studying tens of thousands of patients, so outcomes over broad areas. And that has led to the introduction of the most recent da Vinci robot, which is uh, designed to be able to work in all four quadrants of the abdomen and be able to do general surgery much better. So that leads to lots of robots in many countries. 
And the adoption's been somewhat interesting, and it's been different in the different countries. Uh, in the US, it was very enthusiastically adopted, and that was primarily driven by, uh, there was a lot of early technology adoption before there was a lot of evidence. And the evidence that's now coming out of the US market is because of this large number of robots that were there and being used, and now we're able to follow those patients. What we've seen in Germany is that some of the uh, healthcare or, or the uh, health insurance companies are offering to pay a premium to the hospitals for doing da Vinci surgery because the downstream costs of readmissions and complications are lower for them. And so we're seeing this model that's largely being driven by the health insurance. Whereas here in the UK, there is a lot of focus on making sure that you're using each robot for enough surgeries to make it cost effective. And so the focus is primarily on making sure that robots are at high volume hospitals that have enough procedures in order to make them cost effective. In Sweden, the healthcare system pays for people's sick leave as well as the acute hospitalization. And so they care a lot more about how long it takes people to get back to work. And so they did a study that looked in the Swedish registries, people went back to work after 11 days with da Vinci surgery and after seven weeks with open surgery. And so this paints a wonderful picture. This is really great. Robots are going to be everywhere, it's coming to an operating theater near you. All of these results are primarily because of this, changing the method of access, going from open to minimally invasive, and being able to bring that into surgeries that are otherwise open. And so we've got these really high-tech tools that allow us to do this, but they're not really doing anything different inside. So these are instruments that were unearthed at Pompeii. You clean the rust off, and they really wouldn't look that out of place on a laparotomy tray today. We use tools very much like this. And the whole premise of the regulatory approval of the da Vinci robot was that you were doing exactly the same surgery inside. You were just changing the method of access. And so while we can get great reductions in complications and reductions in length of stay from that, it's not really revolutionizing surgery. And this was brought up actually very well in some of the early, this morning's um, presentations where we talk about the state in which we receive the patient and when we start to do the surgery. So this is a, a staging chart for lung cancer. Kind of gives you an idea, based on the stage of your lung cancer, what kind of a chance of survival you have and what are reasonable therapies. So if you are diagnosed with stage one lung cancer, essentially the smallest that we can find it, very small, peripheral, no spread, you have a 77% chance of seeing the five year anniversary after your diagnosis. If it gets larger, up into the five centimeter range, you've got a 58% chance. You get about 50-50 if you are starting to get some local involvement of lymph nodes. This goes down to about a third if you get lymph nodes that are involved that are in the mediastinum in the middle of the chest. This gets even worse when they start to cross over. And if there's lung cancer out in the periphery anywhere else, it's moved somewhere else in the body, it's metastasized, you have an 11% chance of seeing five years after diagnosis. And on average, patients see 15, we see 15% 15 of patients reach five years, which means we're not catching it at stage one or two. We've got a few that we find incidentally at that stage, but unless we can drive the diagnosis curve down and start treating people earlier in this disease state, we aren't, I can, I can give you a great surgery I can put little tiny incisions in between your ribs and I can take out your tumor and I'm not fundamentally altering the state of the disease. I don't buy you any more time. It's just more comfortable time. So what do we do with these fancy robots? We start to look at them instead of just a method of doing the surgery as a platform of integrating a lot of new and interesting technologies like early detection. This is the dog's nose. I love the owl stone that is finally bringing this. I've been showing this dog's nose for years now because we've known that dogs could differentiate cancer from just from people's expelled breath. And being able to characterize those compounds and be able to get 
an excellent diagnostic so that we move it down into that stage one cancer. And then you have the full benefit of me just going in through a little incision between the ribs and taking out that cancer because it's just a little speed bump in your life instead of some really big brick wall that you're crashing into. The other thing that we start to be able to do, and I love being in the position of getting to sum everybody up, because as we're making new biomaterials, as we're printing kidneys, as we're making scaffolds, as we're making all the bits and pieces that we're gonna use to keep our bodies running, to do this kind of maintenance, we don't want them to be maximally invasive when we're installing these new materials. If I can only print kidney scaffolds and get stem cells to grow into them, there seems to be, from the folks that I'm talking to that are in the kidney world, a limited size of about an inch, uh, three centimeters in length. But I could pop a whole bunch of those little kidneylets into the body and sew them out along the, the vasculature and connect them all up into a manifold just through small incisions because I've got the dexterity to do it. And it allows us to start playing around with some of these technologies. In addition, I'm not the first person to talk about Watson up here either. We've placed a digital step between the surgeon's eyes and the patient's tissue, and the surgeon's hands and the patient's tissue. We're measuring everything about what that surgeon is doing and seeing. And once you've digitized that, now you can start to use ectopic brains like Watson to start interpreting that image, to start doing image recognition on things, to start perhaps peeking over your shoulder and saying, you sure you really wanna cut that? It's really starting to give additional clinical decision-making support. Robotics also allows us to start playing around with scale. The therapies that we've created throughout history of medicine have been at this scale because this is the way surgeons operate. And so I can put my hands on a body and I can do a therapy that's at the scale of something that I'm capable of manipulating. But once I put that digital step between my surrogate hand and my actual hand, I get to break that scale. And I get to work at microscopic or even nanoscopic scales. I can make a comfortable motion of my hand turn into something that's working at the cellular level or even just at the plain microscopic level. And so this is a retina that if you get a shower of little tiny clots up into your retina, you'll go blind. You'll lose sight in the areas that those vessels are feeding. Those vessels are about 30 microns in diameter and the human surgical hand, even the very well-trained human surgical hand, is capable of repetitive motion down to about 100 <coughs> microns in diameter. So you're certainly not going to be able to open that vessel, take out the clot, and close that vessel back up again with the unaided human hand. But I get to start really thinking about how I play with scale and how I start to manipulate at this scale and develop new therapies at this scale because they haven't been available. I haven't been able to implement them because I haven't been able to do manipulations. The other picture is a blastocyst getting a hole drilled in it with a femtosecond laser. And this gets to the identification of good cells and bad cells. If I can unambiguously identify good cells and unambiguously identify bad cells, I can make them glow. I can, they've got some particular characteristics that I can see from some other kind of imaging. I can say, good cell, leave it, bad cell, drill a hole in it. Good cell, leave it, bad cell, drill a hole in it. And now surgery starts being unwinding cancer from around a neurovascular bundle that I get to leave inside the body. I get to leave the patient entirely intact as I start to take these things off. Now, it's going to be a long way before we can do that sort of thing, but these are the kinds of things that we get to start playing around with when we think about this ability to change scale. And with that also comes the ability to change the way we're looking at things. So you're looking at me and you see a reflected white light image. There's not a huge amount of additional information in that, but cameras can see spectrally and cameras can see outside of the visible spectrum. And so we can start putting fluorescence molecules such as indocyanine green into the blood supply, into the bloodstream, and see where the vessels are running. As we tag them onto molecules that bind into cancer, we get this glowing cancer, not glowing 
leave it behind. And it starts to make it much, much easier for us to be able to do the, make sure we're completely taking everything out. So I tend to think of robotics not just as the dexterous manipulator, not just as the surrogate hands that allow us to change the method of access into the body, but as this integration platform that I am looking forward to talking to several of you about how we might start installing your bits and pieces. And so this is the way I tend to look at the world of technology. I'm looking for those adjacencies. I'm looking for the technologies that aren't robotic, that aren't, so, that aren't surgical, but that we can pull onto this platform and really fundamentally affect patient outcomes. And that will revolutionize surgery. So thank you. Um, if I'm a surgeon mm -hmm. and I've never you know, uh, used these robots before, what's my learning curve? So, uh, as a surgeon, you already know how to do the particular procedures, and so you're learning how to use a tool in order to allow you to do those procedures. So the, the typical training path is a day of inanimate training, so little rubbery models, learning to, you know, how do you clutch, the, the, the sort of things that are peculiar to a robotic interface. You then spend a day on tissue-based training, and that could either be animal or cadaveric, depending on the surgical specialty that you have. And at that point, you've been trained on, so that's two days. At that point, you've been trained to the point where you go back to your home hospital. And at that point, it's the hospital's job to finish the credentialing. And generally, what happens is that a hospital will have a senior surgeon proctor a junior surgeon. They will, someone who is learning, will do their first three to five cases under observation by another surgeon who then signs them off and says they're ready to go. A lot of the technologies that we had here on stage are about making things smaller, more portable, mm -hmm. more accessible to people around the world, not just some exclusive hospitals. How can, can we apply that sort of uh, approach to, to a big robotic surgeon? Well, uh, Big robots are large capital investments. I mean, they're large capital investments the way a MRI machine or a CT scanner is a capital investment for a hospital. But the more you use it, the less of that capital cost gets applied to each surgery that you do. And if you're displacing open surgeries and if you're displacing readmissions and uh, complications, it ends up being cost effective. But only if you're using them enough. I mean, if you're using them for 10 cases a year, you'll never make, yeah, it's not cost effective for anyone. But if uh, you're using them between 250 and 400 cases a year, mm -hmm. the hospital is often saving money over the, the costs associated cool. with keeping people hospitalized afterwards. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. <laughs>